If you're thinking welding is something only the pros can do, think again. Hello, I'm Michael Holligan. Welcome to your new house. With some simple tools and simple techniques, you can save money around the house by doing some basic welding yourself. We'll show you how. And super handyman Al Carroll has a do-it-yourself ceiling replacement that'll have things looking up in your house in no time. Plus, the house of the future might not cost as much to build as you may think. And it can save you lots of money every month as well. Steve Easley gives the green light to building green coming up right now on Your New House. Did you know that during the construction of a new home, a builder will send about 20 pickup truck loads worth of construction debris to the landfill? That's a lot of waste. Well, today we're in Austin, Texas, and we're going to take a look at a green building program that teaches builders how to use recycled materials and use them for building products on your new house. Jill Mayfield works with the City of Austin's Green Building Program, advising builders and residents on ways to design and construct environmentally friendly homes. When it comes to floor coverings today, you have a lot of choices when it comes to environmentally sound products. Take this tile, for example. Well, you know, it looks like a normal tile, but what makes it so special? Well, it's recycled glass from windshields of planes and cars. And why is that more environmentally friendly? Well, less of it ends up in the landfill. Yeah, probably use less energy as well, A I guess. whole lot less energy, which creates less pollution. Linoleum is another great choice when it comes to environmentally sound flooring. You remember how dull and boring linoleum used yeah, to be, not very many colors. Today there are lots of beautiful colors when there it comes are. to choosing linoleum. Linoleum is really a great environmentally sound product. It takes a lot less energy to make it because it's made from cork and linseed oil, which are naturally occurring products. Another thing is that it has a really great antibacterial quality to it. Really? That keeps floors cleaner. Interesting. Well, Jill, I hate to paint, and it seems like about every two years I have to paint my deck. This is actually uh, Trex, a composite deck material that's made of recycled materials? Right, it's made from grocery bags and wood chips. It's very durable, you'll never have to refinish it, so it really cuts down on maintenance. This is just another variety of the recycled content decking material. Uh, this has a rougher finish, and so we see this in a lot of different places, both commercial and residential applications. Now you have some carpet over here, right? Right. And this is made out of recycled material? This is made out of pop bottles, believe it or not. Really? This type of plastic is recycled into a very sturdy, stain-resistant carpet. And this, this material here, it, it feels just like regular carpet. Does it wear the same? Just the same. It's very good carpet, and it's readily available. Is it expensive? No, not any more expensive, but people do need to ask for it. I've got some more materials here to show you. The Green Building Program consults with builders to help them make good choices from the foundation to the ceiling. These are some new materials we're seeing in roofing. Pretty exciting. Yeah, well, this looks like a wood shake. What is it uh, made out of? It's actually made out of recycled car tires. Really? Right. Really? This is a slate look, and it's also made out of recycled car tires. Now, will this last as long as um, a normal shingle? or As more? long or longer, really? right. And the right. sun doesn't destroy it? No, it does not. It's very durable. And cost? Cost, a little more up front, but it lasts a very long time. Steve, in addition to helping builders make good choices on building materials, we help them make good choices on landscaping as well. In Central Texas, as is anywhere, it's important to use a water-wise landscaping. Well, when we purchase plants for a home, we're always looking for something that doesn't make our place look barren, but at the same time, saves water. What ideas do you have? Let's see what we advise the builder to do over here. Steve, this is buffalo grass. It's a native Texas grass that's been adapted for lawns. It doesn't require much water, it only grows about six inches, and it's very drought tolerant. Well, I love it, a grass that you don't have to water much and you don't have to mow. What other ideas do you have for landscape? Let's look at some plants over here. So, Jill, what do we have here? Well, this is a xeriscape. These are plants that look good but don't need a lot of water. Well, it does look good. Lots of flowers. The plants have filled in really well. But what about the household? Where do they get their water from? Well, as you can see, we're out in the country and it's a semi-arid climate, so we advise the builder to use a rainwater collection system. How does it work? Well, it's a really efficient way to collect water. Rain falls on the roof, into the gutters, into the downspouts, and into a filtration system under the ground. Steve, this is the filtration system for our rainwater collection system. It uses carbon to take impurities out of the rainwater as it comes off the roof. You mean like uh, bugs, debris, leaves, things like that? Right. Then after that, it goes to an underground holding tank or a cistern. Jill, this is one big tank. 
How much does this hold? About 40,000 gallons. Remember, we took all the rainwater off the roof and through the filters into this holding tank. Well, 40,000 gallons is a lot, but is it enough? It is enough for a family of four for a year for average use, and it only takes about 10 inches of rain a year to keep this tank full. Well, you've showed us a lot of great things today about being environmentally conscious, some of it a little bit exotic. What do you have for the average person? The Green Building Program has an affordable program for people of all income levels. Jill, tell me about this project and where we're at. Now we're in East Austin with Casa Verde Builders. They're building energy efficient, resource efficient homes for low income families. Well, Jill, we're inside the house now. This certainly doesn't look like drywall. No, it's a structural insulated panel and it's a piece of foam sandwiched between two engineered panels. And the foam, the great thing about that is it's made with no ozone depleting chemicals. What kind of R value could we expect out of one of these? A little over 16. Yeah. Another good thing about this wall is that there's no uh, studs used because this is a load-bearing piece, so we use a lot less wood. Yeah, so in a normal home, you'd get maybe 30% of the total buildings is frame, it's wood. Right. And the R value of a wood structural member is not as good as the foam, so this really reduces a lot of that frame. Right, because it's just one piece without the studs, and so there's no transference of air across there, and so you save energy, definitely. Another really cool feature about these houses are the finger jointed studs. Instead of using long pieces of lumber from old grove forests, we're taking shorter pieces and putting them together to make these beams. The green building program not only saves natural resources, but neighborhoods as well. The program built 50 new environmentally friendly homes last year in low income neighborhoods and plans to build 150 more over the next five years. If you'd like more information on the green building program and ways to get a program like this started in your city, Contact us on the internet at michaelholligan.com. Mulching. It's a dirty job, but someone has to do it. Why? Joe Sharinsky has the whys and wherefores on putting mulch on all the right places in your landscape. And cutting and welding metal used to be a heavy-duty project best left to the pros. But new user-friendly technology has made it safer and faster for the average do-it-yourselfer. We'll show you how when your new house returns. The final touches on any landscape includes the application of mulch. Mulch is anything you cover the soil surface with, whether it's a woven polypropylene fabric like this one or one of the other new landscape fabrics. They're all designed to allow air and water to go down through them, but to keep weeds from coming up through them. And of course, mulch can also be shredded bark, cocoa hulls, or even gravel. This is shredded hardwood bark mulch. It has some characteristics that make it a pretty darn good mulch. It's inexpensive, it's readily available, it biodegrades, it insulates the soil, keeps it a little warmer in the winter and a little cooler in the summer, and it retains moisture while it's keeping the weeds out of your landscape. A gravel is another great mulch. It's a little bit more expensive to buy initially, but it lasts forever. And it's very easy to clean leaves and debris off it with a blower vacuum type thing. But there are different gravels. Some are multicolored, like that Colorado Glacier Stone. Some are actually manufactured gravels, not real stone at all. And some are really little. Pea gravel, for instance. Now, I'm not very fond of pea gravel in a landscape because kids, cats, and dogs can knock it out of place very easily. And then there's this. I thought this was dirty gravel when I bought it, but instead, it washes to this. And in fact, it's coated with fertilizer. So we put this muddy looking gravel into the landscape and it washes up to look like this. And of course, when it washes, it also fertilizes your plant. Besides insulating the soil and holding moisture in, mulch can also be used to control erosion. Now in a shady location like this, I'm not at all concerned about weeds coming up. In fact, weeds have a tough time coming up in the shade. But what I want to do here is keep the soil from eroding away. We've got these nice cypress knees coming up here, and I'd like to quit having to mow over the top of them and cut them off. So I'm going to mulch this whole area. You know, when I apply this, 
I want a nice thick layer, at least three to four inches thick. And it'll actually serve as a pathway through this gate behind me and keep this area from being muddy, keep it from eroding. You know, besides all the things that mulch can do, there are a few things that mulch ought to do. Mulch ought to be cheap and readily available. It ought to look pretty. It ought not to harbor pests or smell bad. And it certainly ought not to float, blow, or burn. I don't want it to harbor diseases either. In short, the perfect mulch doesn't exist. But let me show you a mulch and a mulch application that you may not have thought of before. This is rubber dust, and it's a byproduct of the tire recapping industry. Basic black. Any plant, whether green, red, or yellow, looks terrific in this. Think of it as evening wear for your landscape. But this mulch is so difficult to get that I really can't get enough to do a landscape. The demand for it far exceeds the supply. It's time consuming to make and it's wanted because it does one thing that no other mulch does nearly as well. If you fall on it, you bounce. It's perfect for playgrounds. Whatever you need mulch to do, whether it's controlling erosion, holding the moisture in, or keeping the weeds down, mulch, it's got you covered. Metalworking has been a lost art for me for many years simply because it took a lot of equipment years ago. I'm working on a weather vane here. I just made my last cut. I'm using a plasma cutter to cut some parts out for it. Plasma cutter weighs 40 pounds. It'll cut metals up to a quarter inch thick. Also it has some safety feature built into the trigger. It has a trigger guard. You have to lift the guard up before it will operate. Let me show you how that works. Notice here, I can't pull the trigger at all. I lift the guard up. That's what we call a pilot arc. The pilot arc allows you to cut metal, and when you come into an airspace, it will, as soon as you get in contact with metal again, it will keep the machine operating. Some safety gear you'll need when working with metal is a pair of heavy duty gloves. Get them on here. Fire extinguisher is handy to have around. And some safety goggles. Now I'm working on this weather vane. I'm gonna show you how I made it. I'm gonna cut out some stuff. I traced out with a pencil on some metal and all I have to do is simply follow the lines and cut it out. Notice I put a grounding strap on which makes a complete circuit back to the machine. Let's see how it cuts. Now that I've got my last piece cut out from a weather vane, it's time to weld. Over here, we have a wire welder, which will weld flux core or solid wire. Inside the door has a welding guide, so you can adjust the knobs over here for voltage and for the wire feed speed. Simple on and off switch. Let me explain this feed gun to you. If I pull the trigger, the wire just feeds right out of the end like that. The normal distance for welding, to cut that off, approximately 5 sixteenths of an inch. Let's do some welding. Now that I have it tacked in place, I can move it around just a little bit, straighten it up to where I want it. Come back, tack the other side. The other thing that's nice about this one, has a trigger on it, you have to squeeze the trigger before it'll actually weld. It will not direct weld until you squeeze that trigger. The other thing about welding is a welding helmet or hood. Notice this one's unique, has some dials in it, has on and off switch, some dials in it I can set. What it does is it allows me to see clearly through it until that welding arc starts and it automatically darkens. And when that welding arc is gone, it lightens up and I can see clearly again. The other thing is, anything you have around your house with metal, uh, shovels, wheelbarrows, uh, trailers, just about anything metal, 
can repair yourself without any help. Here somebody's kind of beat this shovel up. Let's see if we can fix this guy up here. See how it works. Take the grounding clamp to it. Oh. Hook it up here. Get my hood. Come around here. And turn the machine on. Now actually that weld is stronger than the metal of the shovel itself. That'll hold up fine, be great. All these items I've showed you today about welding, they run in price from seven to a thousand dollars. If you'd like some more information on these, contact us at michaelhulligan.com. If you're never quite sure how close is close enough when you're pulling your car into the garage, here's a quick tip that will eliminate wondering forever. First, you may have to pull your car back and forth a few times to make sure you have it in the right spot. Then once you have it exactly where you want it to end up every day, just take a tennis ball and twist an eye hook into it. Now, it may be kind of hard to get started, but once you get it started, it should go in fairly easily. And just twist it until it's all the way down in there. Then just climb up a ladder and tie some nylon cord or fishing line to the eye hook on your tennis ball. Then hold it from the ceiling so that the tennis ball just barely touches the windshield. Then once you've found the right spot, just take another eye hook and screw it into the ceiling. And you may have to back your car up so that you can get the ladder right underneath it. Then once you have the eye hook securely in place, just tie off the end of the nylon cord so that again the tennis ball just barely touches the windshield. If you hang the ball right over your steering wheel, you'll find that it's very easy to hit your mark every time you pull into the garage. It's time to check out the tub and the faucets and fixtures. The possibilities are endless and Michael helps sort it all out. And super handyman Al Carroll drops by with the how-tos you need to put in a drop ceiling yourself. It's a great way to upgrade a garage or any room in your new house. Well, that's 22 feet, 4 inches. Even though we're measuring the floor, we're going to show you how to put in an exciting new system for ceilings. It's called Ceiling Max. And if you're going to convert your basement into living space or your garage into living space, or maybe you just got an old ceiling that's really cracked up, something you want to hide, this is a great system. They even furnish you with a little wheel here to let you figure out exactly how much material you're going to need. Now our room is 10 by 22 and 4 inches, so uh, we're going to have to go to the next level up, which is 10 by 24. Actually, it's a pretty good idea to have some extra material just in case. Now I've transferred all the information to a drawing here so that you can sort of see what we got going here. Now our room is 10 feet by 22 feet 4 inches. Since we're dealing with 2 foot square tiles, that means we're going to have 4 inches left over. When we divide that, that just leaves 2 inches on each side for a border, and that would not look very good. What we can do though is add the 4 inches to one of these 2 foot square tiles, that gives us 28 inches. When we divide that by two, we end up with 14 inches on each side, and that's a much better looking border. Now the grid system is composed of four different parts. There are three eight foot long pieces. One of them is the wall bracket, another one is the runner, and there's the hanger. And then there's a two foot long element which is called a T. Now the first step toward building our grid is to put the wall brackets all the way around the perimeter of the room. You probably noticed that one lip of the wall bracket is a little wider and that has an advantage to it because now we can either insert our screws directly into the joist or put them into the wall. And remember, always wear your safety goggles whenever you're going to be using power tools. You can use drywall screws every 18 to 24 inches. Now with the wall brackets installed all the way around the perimeter of the room, our next step is to put the runners in place. And to be sure we get them in the right place, we need to measure out from the wall over here. What we're going to do is measure out two feet since we're using two foot square tiles. Then we're going to add three quarters of an inch, and I'll explain why we're doing that 
in just a minute. We make our mark up here. All right, the next thing we need to do is strike a chalk line. I've already got the chalk line hooked up to a nail over on the other side. All I have to do now is pull the line real tight and then give it a good twang and that ought to take care of us. Now we're going to provide for our barter strip. At each end of one of these hangers, there's a one foot section. If we had a smaller border strip, we could handle it this way. Since ours is 14 inches, we come down to the next two foot mark, measure back 14 inches, make our mark, use a square so that we can get a good straight cut. And we're gonna make our cut with 10 snips. And the best way I've found to do it is to cut from the back side here, cut straight in from this side go over and cut from this side, then flip the whole thing over and cut through the center. This is going to take care of our problem with our 14 inch border. Now in order to install our hanger strip, we slip it into the wall bracket and then line it up with the blue line. Remember we added three quarters of an inch when we were getting ready to strike our blue line. The reason being if we had it at exactly two feet, we wouldn't be able to see the line. Now we got a good shot at putting it right in place and being all lined up. Here's a handy tip that you're going to love. When you're dealing with an eight foot long piece, sometimes you can't get anybody to help you. So what we did is we cut off a little piece of the runner and we're going to snap it in place on the end of the new strip, the one we're going to put up next. Then we snap it into place in the one that we just finished putting up. Now they can slide together and help you to hold the thing up. Now that we have our first row of hangers in place, we can forget about measuring. It's going to be automatic. This little T is going to measure for us and when it's snapped in place, it's going to give us exactly two square feet to put our panels in. Now I've already put this one in place so it'll hold this up for me. And now we'll just go ahead and get this one engaged. We have to move this over and when it's snapped in place, it's exactly two feet away from the other ones. Now all we have to do is to get our drill and use a screw to hold it in place. Now we're really on a roll. What we're going to do is continue to put these T's and the hangers all the way across both ways. We're going to end up with perfect two foot square openings plus our barter pieces are going to be 14 by 24 inches. It's going to be a piece of cake. It's time for us to cut our border tiles and I want to show you a little trick that I think you're going to like. What you're going to do is you're going to use the end of the measuring tape as a sort of a tool to mark and also score a line. You just be sure you hold the other part up here straight against the edge and then go to work. And you can see it's scoring a nice line there that's going to make it easier for us to cut. Now probably the best tool for cutting is going to be a utility knife. Just be sure you have a sharp blade and then follow the scored line all the way down. You're not going to cut through the tile, you're just going to cut into it. When you get down at the bottom, you'll be able to just take it and put it across your knee, give it a little spanking and it'll just crack right along the place where you want it to. And that's a nice cut. If there are any rough edges, you can just pull them back like this. They'll never be seen. Well, now it's time to start installing the ceiling tiles. And I got to tell you, this one over in the corner is going to be the most difficult. And to make it a little easier, I'm going to remove this T. And that's going to allow us to take the tile and slide it right into place. And it's a good idea if you make sure that the finished side faces down. Once that's in place, we'll just put the T back in place. And we're ready to move on to the next one. Next, we're going to install this entire row of tiles. First thing I need to do, though, is to rock this T just a little bit. That's going to allow us to put this in place a lot easier. Once we get it in place, we rock it back, and we're ready for the next one. Now, we do just one row at a time so that we can snap the runner in place and give it that finished look. When we get all this done, we'll be able to continue doing the same thing until we got the job finished. And it's not going to take too long. It's really pretty easy. Now that we're away from the wall, you'll be able to see the rocking action that we talked about a little bit earlier. We just slide this in place. And then we rock the T. And it's that easy. 
It also is that easy to remove later on if you need to get up there to take care of wiring or plumbing or anything like that. Man, oh man, what a change. This really looks great. And keep in mind that you have lots of choices in colors and also in finishes because any 2x2 or 2x4 tile will work with this system. If you'd like more information for this easy, quick installation, why don't you contact us on the internet? It's michaelholligan.com. Paint your home off early may be your family dream, but it could turn into a nightmare if you don't know about some penalties. I'll explain in today's Mortgage Moment. And Steve Greenberg shed some new light on the world of switches. All this and a lot more coming up on Your New House. If you'd like a detailed list of the tools and materials needed for any project that you've seen on the show, you can find it on the internet at www.michaelholligan.com. If you're looking for a way to save money in the face of rising mortgage interest rates, you might consider a prepayment penalty mortgage. Penalties are usually available on adjustable rate mortgages, but you can find them on some fixed rate mortgages too. A prepayment penalty mortgage will give you a lower interest rate or lower points or a combination of the two. You could save between one eighth and one half of a percentage point by accepting a prepayment penalty. On mortgages with higher interest rates, such as subprime loans and no documentation loans, the discounts could be even bigger. What's the trade-off? You agree to stick to a yearly payoff allowance. If you pay more than your allowance, you pay the penalty. Most of the time, you can pay as much as 20% of your loan balance each year without triggering a penalty. The penalty fee is usually equal to some percentage of the amount you overpay. Prepayment penalty mortgage arrangements vary. Some will assess a penalty if you refinance your loan, while others will penalize you if you pay off your mortgage by selling your home. You usually sign on for a one, three, or five year prepayment penalty agreement. Some states don't allow prepayment penalties at all, and some place certain restrictions on them. So check with the local lender to find out what your local prepayment penalty regulations are. Finally, before you sign a prepayment penalty agreement, you should seriously consider two things. First, how long do you intend to stay in your new home? And second, which way you think interest rates are headed? You don't want to have to pay a penalty for selling your home or for refinancing your loan to take advantage of a drop in the interest rates. If you're looking for a way to beat the summer heat, a misting system might be the answer for you. By installing an outdoor misting system on your patio, it can reduce the temperature by as much as 20 degrees. Now we have a fairly large patio. The perimeter is about 30 feet. So we've purchased all of our pieces individually. But if you have a smaller patio, you can get all the necessary pieces in a kit. Let's get started. These are the misting nozzles, and these need to be placed every 24 inches down the pipe. Now this is half inch PVC pipe that I'm using, and I've already marked this every two feet. But if you buy a kit, the pipe will come pre-cut for you. This tool that I'm using is a PVC pipe cutter. And this tool will cost you about $7, and it really makes cutting this pipe easy. We're going to go ahead and lay everything out and put everything together on the ground first before we attach it around the patio. Now that I have all of the pieces cut, I'm ready to start gluing them. There is a procedure to gluing though. It's not hard, but if you don't do it right, then your system could leak. What you want to do is take some PVC primer and clean all of your pieces. So you're going to clean the pipe, and you also want to make sure that you clean both sides of the nozzle as well. Now if you'll notice, I'm doing this over the grass because this purple can stain your patio. Once you get these cleaned, take some PVC glue. Put this on your pipe just like this. Now when you put the nozzle on, give it a quarter turn just like that and that will lock it in place. Now what's really important is once this glue dries, you can't move these. So as you continue moving on down, make sure that these are lining up and they're straight with each other. I'm just going to continue gluing until I get both of my straight runs done. I'm through gluing all of the pieces together. This shorter run, I'm going to hang right here on this side of the patio. And then there's a longer run that will hang on the other side. Now, as you can see, I've made sure that all of the nozzles are straight. And this is a good time to take these out. These just screw in and out. Once we get this hung, we're going to need to flush the system so that there's not any dirt or debris left in the pipes. 
Be sure and put these somewhere safe though as you take them out so you don't lose them. Once we get all of these out, we can go ahead and hang this up. What I'm doing now is loosely hammering in about three clips for each run. These will hold this in place so that I can make final adjustments before I firmly attach it. Start with your starting clip at least an inch higher than your ending clip. You need a good one inch pitch so that the water can drain out in the winter time. Now I need to go down at the other end and attach an elbow to hold both runs together. Now that I've got both runs hung, you can see why it was important to loosely hammer these in. Now I can make adjustments to the pipe. Before I glue the elbow on, pay attention to where your nozzles are. You don't want these pointing straight down. What you want to do is tilt them out just slightly. And I've already put primer in both ends of this elbow. So now let me just put some glue. Let me check my nozzles on this side. Stick this on and turn it just slightly. Okay. More glue on this end. Check the nozzles one more time. Now that I've got the elbow glued, I can tighten these clips. And what you want to do is put a clip between every other nozzle. You'll need to add a drain to the system. Remember, you put it in at a one inch slope so that you could drain it in the winter time so your pipes don't freeze and crack. What you need to do is take an elbow, glue it to a short piece of pipe, and this is your drain. You can unscrew this and drain it when you need to. Let me just add a little glue inside the elbow, like that, and then I can glue it to this end of the system. Now all we have left to do is run this system to the water source. This was a fairly simple project that only took us a couple of hours. As you can see, all of my runs are in place and I've added a shorter run just to follow the line of the ceiling so that I could run this pipe down to the water faucet. It's a good idea to add a two-way adapter to your faucet. That way, you're not completely losing the use of your faucet if you're using your misting system. You can still use your garden hose and you can turn each side off and on as you need them. The last thing that we need to do to complete our system is add one more elbow and then we can flush this out. Before you flush the system, be sure and open the drain. Then you want to let the water run for a good two to three minutes. After that, you can add your spray nozzles and your system's ready to use. The only maintenance required for the misting system is to drain it in the winter time and then in the spring time, take the spray nozzles out and clean them with some vinegar and water. That way you can get rid of any calcium deposit that may have built up. We put this whole system in for less than $60 and to be able to cool our patio temperature by as much as 20 degrees, well, it was well worth it. If you would like more information on this project or others, contact us on the internet at michaelholligan.com. Do you ever wonder how long the new materials that you're thinking about buying for your new house or home improvement project may actually last? Well, here's some quick tips that'll help you weigh out your investment. If you're planning on putting ceramic tile on the floor, you can pretty much plan on that lasting you about 100 years. That is, barring any accidents that may actually crack it. If you're thinking of putting carpeting on the floor, the life expectancy for carpet is about 11 years. So you probably want to do go ahead and make room in your budget and plan on replacing that every few years. Now you can also put pine and oak down and with proper care that'll last about a century also. And when it comes time to put a fresh coat of paint on the wall, have you ever thought about the life expectancy of that paint? Well, it's usually going to be about five to ten years depending on the quality of the paint and the quality of the paint job. And the sheetrock behind that paint, that's going to last you about 70 years. A lot of homeowners are used to talking in terms of 30-year roofs. An asphalt shingle roof, you can usually get a guarantee anywhere between 50 to 30 years. And with a slate roof, you can sometimes get a guarantee between 50 to 100 years. 
If you're thinking of using wood siding, it really depends on the quality of the wood and how well you keep it painted or sealed from the weather. It might only last you 10 years, but with good quality and care, it could last up to 100. With aluminum siding, that'll last you anywhere from 20 to 50 years, and with vinyl siding, you can easily expect to get a 50-year lifespan. Lights, camera, action. Steve Greenberg throws the switch on the latest in high-tech accessories that can make your life a breeze when we come back to your new house. Our tub and toilet don't match. Black and blue don't match? No, not really. Hey, that's what I got in my house. Nobody's ever said anything to me. There's a number of things you need to consider when picking out your tubs and toilets besides color. That's also style and comfort. We'll start with comfort on a toilet. We'll lift up this lid and you notice that it's elongated instead of just an oval. Oval toilets are fine if you're in a confined area, but if you've got as much room as we do here, go with an elongated toilet. It's much more comfortable. Now most toilets have been gravity fed. That means there's water up above the toilet. When you flush the handle, the valve lifts up. The float goes down as the water goes down. Once the valve shuts, it starts filling back up with the water and the float starts rising back up. So gravity is the way it operates. Now that's fine when you had the old style toilets that had 4.1 gallons of water because you could push out just about any amount of toilet paper. But now toilets get clogged because they only can use 1.6 gallons of water. A few years ago, the EPA worked with the government, got a law passed where that's the maximum amount of water you can use in a toilet, so it stops up constantly. Now there are baffles being made by Sloan Manufacturing that most of the different toilet manufacturers now put in some of their toilets that fits here. And instead of gravity flow, that baffle holds air. When it fills up with water, that air gets condensed and it forms air pressure. When you flush the toilet, that pressure blows that 1.6 gallons of water right through your toilet system so you don't get clogged up anymore. It's a nice feature to have. It costs a little extra, but it's gonna save you a lot of trouble as far as getting clogged up. Now when it comes to bathtubs, there are a million options. The most common is steel with a porcelain finish on it, normally five or six feet long, pretty much rectangular. You can also get cast iron, you can get standalones, but this is actually an acrylic tub that we've installed. It's got a nice oval shape to it, so there's plenty of room. Feature I really like on tubs is right here, and that's a grab handle. Since it is wet and there is soap there, it's gonna be slippery. This is very nice to have. Always keep your tubs around knee height. Any higher than that, you might have a problem when you get out of the tub. Faucets and fixtures, again, endless amount of choices. Here we have a nice setup because you can actually pull it, move it anywhere that you need to in the bathtub. The only thing we're missing is either a door or a shower curtain that we can add at any time. Something else I really like on this tub is our shower surround. Instead of going with tile or marble, we went with a solid surface like you see on countertops. This is really nice because if it ever gets dirty, you can just sand it down and it's the same color all the way through and through. Plus it's nice to be able to add shelves to it, which you can do with a solid surface. Now there's a lot of options in tubs. One I really like is in the master. Let's go take a look. Now this is a tub I really like. We've got a corner bathtub and it is huge. It's got a great shape to it, plenty of room. We've got a seat over on the side, but what's really nice is we have whirlpool jets inside. Here you can see we've got six jets, three on each end. Very, very nice. Here's our intake for the jets. The water pulls in there and then it recirculates back out through here. Now to have something like this work, you've got to have a motor. And a problem I see with a lot of people when they put these in is they build out all the way around the tub and there's no way to have access to the motor. That motor can burn up or a seal can go bad. You need to leave yourself a way to get into it. Here's our motor down below that circulates the water. Here's our plug-in. Very easy to get to. It's always important to leave yourself a way in or else you're going to have to remodel your house the next time the motor goes bad. As far as switches, we're not going to electrocute ourselves because we have a switch that's controlled by air. Just push in there, it's on, the motor's running. Push in there and it's off, but no electricity around the tub itself. Here's our dials to adjust the pressure. We've got one dial for these three jets and then a dial over there for the other three jets. We've got our conventional drain down here at the bottom, plus an overflow drain if the water gets too high. 
goes right in these holes, drains out through our system. One other thing you need to look at when you're picking out your tubs, that's your fixtures. Here we've got a great faucet with a really nice finish on it that's totally scratch resistant. We can take steel wool to this Moen faucet and we're not going to tear up the surface of it. Very, very nice. So remember how you're going to be using the tub. If you have kids that are going to be in this bathtub, go with the scratch resistant faucet. If you'd like more information about picking out the right tubs, toilets, and fixtures for your new house, contact us on the internet at michaelholligan.com. Now today's Check This Out segment is a bit of a switch because all the products we're looking at are switches. First one is right over here. And you know how when you're leaving your house there are so many things you don't want to forget? Well, you can leave yourself a bunch of notes or you can get this. It's the Parrot Digital Messaging Switch Plate. The way it works, you record a message in it just like this. Don't forget your keys. Then when you're about to leave your house and you're turning off the lights. Don't forget your keys. Ooh, my keys. It reminds you. Now, the cost of this is about $20, and it's in the Sporties catalog. Now, for some other cool switches, check this out. Now, this is the Autocron, and the company that makes this claims it's the only wall switch timer that doesn't require any wiring. This couldn't be easier to install. All you do is remove the top screw from any switch plate, and you line up the one screw it takes to install this, just like that, and then just put it in like that. A few turns, once you have it hooked up, it operates with two AA batteries right there, and here are the controls right down here. Now you can program it by hour increments so it can turn whatever you want on and off. Once it hits that timer, then it just does that, flips the switch, and in this case, turns on the ceiling fan. It could be turning on a chandelier or really any electrical appliance that doesn't plug in that works off of a wall switch. This is the way to go. The cost, about $40, and it's in the Sporties catalog. Now, if you're looking to control one light fixture from two different locations and you don't want to install a second wall box, well, Leviton's Decor Collection has a solution. It's right over here, and this is a little mini receiver, and this is a remote control. What you do is you replace an existing switch, which we've already done, with this receiver. Then you take the remote control and you walk it down the hall, and now this remote switch can be mounted anywhere. I'm going to put it right inside this bedroom door right here. Now I can control the hallway lights with just a push of a button. I can turn them off and turn them back on just like that. It's great for a hallway or a stairwell. And other than changing the initial switch, there's no fancy wiring needed. Now this is also from Leviton's Decora collection. And with this, anything that plugs into an outlet, you can turn on and off with this remote control. So for example, I've taken these accent lights and I've plugged it into a similar remote. So by just pushing this button, I can turn them off and turn them back on. Now you can take this remote control and you can mount it on the wall right here. And now I can turn those lights off and back on again. Or I could mount this onto a brick wall or onto a concrete wall. Being there's no wiring, it couldn't be easier. Now this product and the last are both under $35 and both available through smarthome.com. Now if you're looking to control more than one electrical appliance or one electrical outlet, well then check this out. Now, smarthome.com also has the X10 powerhouse system. And just like with the last product, again, you have a remote control controlling an outlet. Only with this system, one remote can control four outlets if you buy four of these receivers. You can control the frequency by this little dial right here. There's an antenna right here, so it can pick it up just about anywhere in the house. What's nice also is that this remote control can be used as a handheld unit, or you can wall mount it. The cost, each one of these receivers goes for about $25. Now, if you're looking to control an outlet, but you want to do it hands-free, well then check this out. And finally, there's this product, which is called IntelliVoice. Now, IntelliVoice allows you to turn an outlet on or off with just your voice, no hands needed. Right now, we have this lamp plugged into it, and it's listening for the word L-I-G-H-T-S. When it hears that word, the lamp will go on. I'm going to test it right now. Here we go. Lights. There you go. When it hears that word again, it'll turn the lamp off. Lights. There you go. It costs about $50, and it's from SmartTech, and it certainly adds new meaning to your voice turns me on. Now, for more information on any of these light switches <laughs> or any of the other Check This Out products, check out our website at michaelholligan.com.